Okay, everybody. Uh, it's six o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. And before I call Laura up to the podium, uh, as this is a work session that's specifically scheduled to be about the 2016 budget policy, uh, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Uh, we're going to have this be a an interactive work session. Uh, but we're going to uh, do it in an orderly fashion, uh, beginning with presentation. And this is for the governing body as well as the citizens in attendance. Uh, Laura's got about 20 or 30 minutes worth of things to discuss with us. Uh, I'm going to ask everybody if we could please save your questions. Uh, when she finishes up, we're going to open the floor for questions first from the governing body. Uh, and then uh, after that, we're going to open it up for comments and questions from the audience. And matter of fact, we're going to encourage uh, comments and questions from the audience. Uh, but this is, uh, this is just the next part in the process. And it's, it's kind of the um, jumping on point uh, what we've done so far is, has been informational to help get us to this point. Uh, some of the things that Laura is going to talk with us about tonight and some of the things that we might have questions about are going to be things that maybe she doesn't have answers for this evening and everybody should be uh, aware of that. Uh, we're doing things differently. We started talking about budget related items back in January. Uh, at the January 20th uh, work session, uh, we reviewed the Comprehensive Pavement Management Program. On uh, January 22nd, uh, we held a Citizens Budget Forum. Uh, February 16th, uh, we were presented uh, system assessments for the water, wastewater, and electric utilities. Uh, February 23rd, we had a CIP Citizen Workshop. And then March 2nd, we had a, a law enforcement slash Justice Center uh, space and feasibility study. Uh, these are all things that are going to play a part in, in this year's uh, budget discussions. Uh, and uh, while uh, the interactive part of the work session is, is kind of a, a work in progress, uh, there's certainly some of us here that remember that uh, work sessions were never uh, an interactive process before. Uh, I've been attending council meetings since two years before I got elected, back in 2009, and uh, uh, work sessions were held back in the back room. Uh, we didn't record any of them, uh, and, uh, and there was uh, uh, very little information that was shared with the, the, the public in advance, and I realize there's not a lot of information that was part of uh, the agenda, but that's uh, part and parcel of uh, policy development. We're not to the point where we're, where Laura's coming back to us with actionable information. We're still in the development portion. So uh, just hope that everybody would keep that in mind. I believe for those of you that may or may not have uh, 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 maybe a, a scratch pad or pens, I think there's some at the back table in, in case you want to take notes. As we're working our way through, uh, we've all got things to write with up here. Uh, but uh, by all means, uh, help yourself if you need it, and uh, and we'll go ahead and get started. And Laura, good evening. Good evening. Well, semi good evening, Katie Law. Great evening. Whatever, whatever. Yeah. Oh, oh, one, one other thing uh, to, to anybody that's sitting around the dais, lean in and speak into the microphones like Todd just yeah. did. Wichita State. No. <laughs> Since he's a council member, I have no response. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Several problems right there. It's okay. Let me, if I can't, if you can't hear me, let me know. Okay, well, here we go. 
2016 budget policy work session. Priority-based budgeting is not only a best practice for fiscal stewardship and accountability for results, but it's also a budget method that allows for continuous process improvement as the cycle contains phases for monitoring and adjustments as shown in seven and eight, step seven and eight. So this is our third trip around this cycle. This trip is for the 2015 revised and the 2016 budget. As the mayor talked about, the first year for the 13-14 budget, we took stakeholder input from largely the business community. And then in the second year, last year's budget, 14-15, we took input from the faith-based community, the citizen survey, and various committees working on our economic development policy and the comprehensive plan. And we also re-implemented a CIP program using an improved process. Third trip. In keeping with our commitment to continuous process improvement, this year staff is focusing on getting input from others as never before. We're proactively gathering stakeholder input. The mayor talked about how he's been here a few years. I've been here 26. I've been your finance director for 10. We've never done it like this before. So we heard our citizens' concern that they didn't get to provide enough input. So we improved our process to include their input. The mayor talked about that in January, the citizen budget forum in February that we talked about CIP. We heard the governing body's concern that the input on the budget is too late in the process. So we're also moving your input right up front. As we talked about the first time ever, which kind of gives me a little bit of problem for answering some of your questions, but we'll do what we can. Because at the front of the process, getting your input is what you prefer to reacting to a budget that we created for you. Again, we're not seeking fine-tuned decisions tonight because I don't have the information to help you with that anyway. We need general direction. Mm -hmm. So you always start with where you are now and before your eyes light up, these are unaudited, unlikely to significantly change, but unaudited, and before you start making notes, let me get through the whole presentation. <coughs> Is that enough disclaimer for you? Because yeah, it's pretty good right now, so hold on. 2014 general fund summary for your 2014 actuals versus your 2014 revised budget. Revenue pretty square up, exceeded the estimate by 2%. That means we're 98% on track, yay. Expend expenditures were less than estimate by 8%, $943,000. Again, I see your eyes lighting up, don't. Fund balance increased from estimated 43% to 57%. Fund balance is only one part of the picture. So I'm gonna keep going and give you the whole picture. We talked about general fund revenues. The biggest drivers of that was <laughs> still increased in city sales and use tax and our share of the county sales and use tax, uh, about, about 210 of that, 225,000. So, um, yay, it's good. General fund expenditures, $943,000. You can consider two thirds of this as real savings. Let's go with 662. Personnel savings are real savings that staff created with strategic decisions to phase hiring, like we always do. Every time a position comes open, we reevaluate positions for efficiency, and we're also always realigning the resources to transform to a high performance organization. So that's to deliver it. You can consider the next two is committed. We talked about the IT network delay from the, that we just shifted that timeline. It's still a three year timeline, we moved it over a year. So that one's still committed, as well as about another 100,000 in delayed projects. Again, those will come back up to you in your 2015 revised. They're committed. They just didn't happen in 2014. <coughs> Water fund summary, 2014 actual versus 2014 revised. Revenue exceeded estimates by 6.4% or $300,000. Expenditures less than estimate by 13.7, $710,000. Fund balance increased from 19% to 45%. I know, I saw that. I know you're wondering yeah. if we can roll back rates. Time out. I'll remind you that staff
staff knew during 2014 that we were having those utility assessments. And we didn't have the results. So we held up on things we could hold up on in order to, and we knew there would be things that would require funding, so we held up and let that fund balance build because we also know the governing body is sensitive to rate increases. So that was only part of the picture. Let me keep going. Just to recap on the revenue, it, of course, there isn't a whole lot of water revenue other than water sales. That was the most of it. We did get a little bit more water development fee than we expected, but the majority of it was from sales, and part of that's because we did the graduated rate increase thing. Water fund expenditures. Back to my point about the extra fund balance, and remember that I say we made conscious decisions to delay what we could because we knew the assessment findings would have something that we would need to pay for. So you can consider the first three totaling about 366,000 as real savings. The largest savings component was because of the renegotiation of the Rule 7 buyout, that we had a discrepancy in the cap rates in the contract, and by the time we got all through that, it was less than expected. So that's fantastic. You're going to be glad in a minute. Um, personnel, that's not a lot, but it's a little. There's some, some that's largely the utilities director. Um, and then the internal service funds, just talked about the IT network, that's the water funds portion of that, and there was some savings in utility buildings that gets charged back to that too. So between the two, you got some savings there. Part of that's committed because of the IT deal. And then there's another 185000 as discussed, delayed on purpose, waiting for the results of the assessment. Wastewater funds, same kind of deal. 2000 actual versus 2014 revenues square up to what was estimated. Expenditures less by 7.8%, 449,000. Exact same thing, strategic delays. Fund balance increased from 18 to 28. You can consider the first four items totaling about 259,000 as real savings. Again, the internal service fund, same thing. IT network, some savings in utility billing. So that's mostly committed. And then another 82,000 committed coming back to you in 2015 revised. Electric funds, gonna keep reminding you, fund balance is only part of the picture. Revenue less than estimate by 1.6%, minus 240. Uh, electric's tough to, go, tough to project, but there you go. And that's two years in a row now. Mild summer. We'll get to that. I don't really know. Expenditures less than estimate by 4.3. 4.3 doesn't sound like a big a number. And the electric fund is $600,000. So again, fund balance increased from 29 to 33. Electric fund expenditures. Let's talk about the 608000 This slide illustrates several things. First thing, it's a good thing we had personnel savings and these other savings that we're showing here that are over a million dollars, because look at the bottom two bullets. We significantly under budgeted the cost for wholesale electric and for capital improvements. Now, while we're close to filling those vacant positions, and once we do, without these project delays, this kind of shortfall would not have been sustainable this would have been a big deal. So this speaks to the need for a stronger liaison relationship between finance and utilities because we need to get a better handle on these budget projections. This is not okay. We got lucky this year. And with much of this savings is to offset it, but the finance staff is gonna work a lot closer with the new utilities director and review the revenue and expenditure projections. And I'm gonna throw something out, it's probably time consider some independent outside expertise person to work with us and the U Utility Advisory Commission because I really think you need to look at an electric rate study. So just throwing that out there. Um, so back to what I talked about. These end of the year 2014 fund balances were all prior to the utility assessment findings. There's nothing in 2014 for the findings because we didn't know them yet. Um, and so your increased fund balances are going to be very beneficial to mitigating any impact that we might have had to do with rate increases. That's going to help a lot. 
One other thing I want to remind you, we have a, uh, we've talked several times about a refinancing that we're pending for, and that's going to help the water fund some more because we're going to refinance the Hillsdale plant, and that'll help a lot. Cur currently, the interest rates look like about half of what we have on those. So, um, I've said this before, but I'm going to remind you that we're aware you don't like rate increases. So we'll be reviewing the assessment findings with your sensitivity to rate increases in mind. So moving on to what we do know for the 2015 budget. We got our market um, appraisal information from County Appraiser Welcome in February. I talked a little bit about it during the fire study, but here's the recap. The market value increase of 8.5%, so the existing base growth, 8.5%, means about $360,000 to your general fund and about $135,000 to the bond and interest fund. Again, market value increase and cost savings are only parts of the whole picture. Priority-based budgeting is about aligning our resources to our needs and to your goals. And so we need your priorities, and that's why we're asking for them up front. So keep, keep all this in mind. We're only partway there. So again, it's also a process of continuous process improvement. We're asking for your input up front because we want to develop a budget with your stuff up front instead of reacting to what we've developed. And so there's a big difference, like the mayor said, in what I'm going to be able to answer for you going forward from here. This is March. We usually talk in July. That's four, four and a half months difference of an entire army of city staff doing literally thousands of calculations and trending projections, all of us, every department. And right now, as an example, I do not have one iota of sales tax information for 2015 because it's a two month lag and all I've got is 2014. I don't have March yet, which would be January. So we're going to be working a little bit blind, but this shows you where you're starting from. You all know your strategic goals. Probably most people in this room know the strategic goals. This is the whole, part of, whole point of priority-based budgeting. We're going to filter all of our discussion from now on through these goals because that's why we do it. We're aligning resources with these goals. So what I'm getting ready to do is I'm getting ready to show you a comprehensive list within your goals, and then I'm going to walk you back through more detail on each one, set you up for all of your policy points and decision points, and then walk away, and then we'll you go from there. So right now, here's the umbrella look, the higher view look. In economic development, you have the discussion pending about growth areas. We've had lots and lots of talks on the Economic Development Task Force and the symposium and the business community about incentives. You have quality of life issues, um, which is always values versus return on investment. You have trails, pedestrian bridges, and city entrance signs. At this point, none of them are budgeted. It's a little over a million dollars for the three, and they need to be cash funded because they're not eligible to be debt funded. And they're going to have a problem with opportunity costs, and I'll talk about that in a minute for these. Infrastructure and asset management. The mayor talked about all the input you've had. You've had a pavement assessment. You've had CIP stuff from the trainer people and other things we've talked about ad nauseum about the CIP programs. You've had input from your citizens from February. And you have utility assessments. Again, staff is very aware of your tolerance for rate increases. And then you have this issue of fiscal stewardship. How are we going to pay for all this? Because priority-based budgeting, the whole point is there will always be more needs than we have resources. So we're going to talk about revenue generation and prioritization. Okay, smaller look. Economic development. The number one goal is economic development because we want to diversify our tax base, and frankly, it facilitates the other three. So, well, I'm going to walk you through your decisions and then we'll come back. 
one of the first questions is where does the governing body want to concentrate on economic development? Do you want to do your interchanges? Do you want to do downtown? Don't need a decision right now, I'm just laying them out. The information from the task force and the work session and the symposium all said that you need an incentive catalyst. So, do you want to consider proactively building infrastructure? <coughs> It was suggested at the symposium that we have an infrastructure cost analysis ready to go. If we went to the interchanges, remember Bruce Kimmel said it'd be good to have an engineering study. So one of those questions is, do you want that? Do you want to leverage your utility assets? That was discussed at the symposium and at the work session. One consideration for your funding, you see it up there, is the half cent sales tax. The one we have ends this December. We've been paying, it's, a t it's been a 10 year sales tax and also a sales tax. Remember, we've talked about it before. It gets other people to help pay for our needs. Currently, that half cent sales tax is worth a million dollars a year. And as you can see here, I've got a little parenthesis that says 50%. There's a reason for that. That other 50% of that half cent sales tax or a quarter needs to go somewhere else. We'll get to that in a minute. Quality of life. We talked about this. We talked about it in the citizen workshop. Community values and public values are messy. Community values don't necessarily have return on investment. And the example I gave at the workshop was the police department's budget is $4 million. Court fines, bring, court fines is the only revenue the police department makes indirectly. It only covers 10% of that budget. But we take great pride in knowing we're the fifth safest city in, in the state, and that is obviously representative of our community values, but there's no quantitative ROI on things like that. Not all projects and services have ROI, but they're very important to your community and public values, and that's the whole difference between government and private industry. Government's here to provide services for the greater good. Private industry does those for profit. And, and you get a little mix of both. I'm not saying it's one or the other, but we weigh a lot more heavily towards the values. Remember I talked about the park trails and the bridges and the city gateway signs? Not budgeted, not doing debt. They have to be cash funded, general fund. <coughs> At the moment, the extra money in the general fund, even from the market value increase, is going to be needed for the bond and interest fund. As I've talked before about the challenges in the bond and interest fund, and you still need to cover the bond and interest fund, and you still need to maintain a certain amount of fund balance for your city credit rating. So I've talked about the bond and interest fund over and over and over and over, we'll get to it in a minute, but it's all about delinquencies. So we'll get there in a second. And as I mentioned a minute ago, there's an opportunity cost with delay, especially on the park trails, because right now cheap oil prices equals cheaper asphalt. And so it's gonna cost, if you wanna fix your trails, it's gonna cost about half what it will cost when the oil prices start going back up. So that's your opportunity cost you need to wrestle with. One of the questions I'm going to ask you at the end is do you want staff to try to phase in these projects, cash finance to the general fund, and we'll still be doing it in a proportionate to maintaining that fund balance for our credit rating. So I'm going to ask you that pretty soon, but I'm framing it up now. Infrastructure and asset management. I just told you that pretty much all the new value in the general fund is going to be needed for the bond and interest fund. For years, I've talked about the delinquent benefit districts. Heads up, I've told you this before too, remember, 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 our favorite benefit district is a quarter million dollars a year. They're not paying. They probably aren't going to pay. They paid some of their parcels the first half of the first year. This is only year two. The statutory process <coughs> does not move forward with the county action until they've got to at least three years delinquent, that's before they can even start 
and I've talked to you before about they don't exactly work timely over there. Um, they told us it would be mid the statutory process before you actually collect. If it's done timely, is five, five and a half years. As an example, we have just now talked to the county that they are just now moving forward on our 2008 delinquency. So we're looking at eight years before we get anything, if we get anything. So, and that's really out of our hands. We talk to them every year, more than once, logging it. They're going to do what they're going to do, and it's a statutory process. Besides, we can't even move on the Russells yet. We talked about the pavement assessment. If you recall, the study indicates that you have 6.6 .6 million in the first three years to, to get everything up to where you want it to be, and then it was about 615,000 annual maintenance after that. Um, that's why I talked about the half cent sales tax. You can't do that if we don't get a quarter of it. You're not gonna be able to do it at that scope. Can't afford it. So if you want to move forward in the way the assessment presentation was, and there was that tipping point curve, where if you don't do it before everything goes really poorly and then it costs, what was it, fourfold or fivefold if you wait, we need to talk about alternative revenue generation. Again, sales tax helps other, gets other people to help pay for what we need. The CIP projects. I can tell you that the maintenance projects, maintenance projects, so think the city hall roof, some of the smaller improvements, if you choose Westside Park, that's a maintenance project. Those are something I can work into the bond and interest fund for you. They're probably sustainable. Any new facilities, police department, Salt Lake Works and Parks, any of those things that you're thinking about, if you want to do any of those, we have to have a new funding source. Or you can reduce the scope and the phasing of the projects because I can't fit them in reminding you that, and it was discussed at the citizens workshop as well, delaying CIP just exacerbates the problem, especially for maintenance projects. You just push it out, it doesn't go away, and it costs more or later, just like the tipping point curve in the street assessment. Covering from the general fund, which I can do for now for the delinquency, the, two, the Russell delinquency, the ongoing quarter million a year, I can cover that for you. I can't do it forever in the general fund. So, and then finally utilities, as I said, those big fund balances, you're going to be glad you have them, and that we strategically created some savings to help along, because what we're going to have to do, I can't give you any answers on that tonight, I can tell you that we'll evaluate the assessment findings, and remember that you're sensitive to rate increases. So one of the things I'm going to ask you at the end of this, is the governing body interested in an independent consultant to work with staff in the UAC about that electric rate assessment? That's one of the things I'm going to ask you. The other the findings and stuff, I'll, staff will take care of that for you. So here we are, the last, last strategic goal, fiscal stewardship. I've talked several times about revenue generation. I mentioned to you that I need staff needs that 8.5% market value increase, all of it, to cover your bond and interest fund. If we did not have that growth, I would be standing here asking you for an increase from the mills for bond and interest. I, that 8.5% valuation increase will cover it. I've been talking about that delinquency has been a problem, and I've been saying it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. We're here. It's critical mass moment. Um, remembering that you've got one benefit district that's not even delinquent, quarter million a year. That adds up in a real hurry before you can do anything about it. So a reminder, CIP, CIP maintenance projects are sustainable, new facilities are not, they'll need new revenue. Streets and Echo Dev, if you want to consider a half cent sales tax, that'll take care of your streets as presented. And you can use the other half for economic development, as we've talked about. There's also, we've kicked around in the past, a stormwater fee. There are a few stormwater projects in our CIP. 
Many cities have a flat fee that they just add on the utility bill. I'm not prepared to even estimate that for you. I'm just saying it's another funding source you can consider. And after that, that's pretty much the end of where you are and framing up the decision points we're going to come back to. So I can stand aside or whatever the mayor would invite me to do until. Well, I want to give the governing body an opportunity to ask questions first, as I discussed at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, so, uh, and, and maybe, uh, you know, uh, certainly there's probably some questions, but then also maybe we <coughs> dial back to the beginning of the policy consideration mm -hmm. and start working our way through that as, as well. Sure. Uh, but uh, anyone have questions? I'll, Christy, do you have anything to start? Well, I, I have some questions just about the process um, for the half-cent sales tax. I guess from my perspective, I personally wouldn't support that unless it went out for a vote. I mean, I think it's it has to. It's okay, it has so, to. So what's the timing for that? I mean, what, so if we, I mean, it's up at the end of this year, right? Right. So from a budget perspective. You're not going to get it in 60 months. Okay, so, so we would basically go without and rely on that. Any enhancements that we would say that would support would be in 2017. At least, right, that's correct. Okay. Right. You're, you're not gonna get it in, because your other one doesn't even sunset till 50, right. so that's not really fair. If we're gonna, yeah. I don't wanna say reinstate it because you have to go out for a new vote. Right. But if we're gonna continue it under a new process, you can't really go there till 16. So, right. so we would want to put it out for a vote I mean, in 16, we would need to get sure it started this year. next year because you would need time. You, you're going to need probably a special election to do it because it has to go out for a vote. Mm -hmm. You're going to need time to develop the projects that you're going to right. specifically find. right because right. the success of getting those approved is contingent upon <coughs> identifying what you're going to do with those resources. <coughs> so we need to lay out those projects mm -hmm. and then start that process and then look at a time frame to do special election next year for it. Okay. Are we limited to a half cent? No. Or is that no. I mean, no, that's just what you, you have now. That's no. what we have. It that's would what be you have now. Right. And the only reason we looked at a half cent is because you have that now and so there would be a little bit of a breather in terms of the time frame that it's being paid and when you go back out and have a new one start. Mm -hmm. right. Tolerance has already been developed for it. Correct. That's so you you've already developed a tolerance for a half cent. Half cent. And it's grown to where it's it's significant. I mean, it, it, it wasn't worth a million dollars 10 years ago, but it is now, and that's very beneficial to your street projects. Would there not be a way to get that on a ballot in November? I'm not, maybe. We would have to work I mean, with Bob. My concern, I mean, is if we don't, mm -hmm. and it rolls off, mm -hmm. and we go back down to, I think it's like, what is it, 8.275 mm -hmm. or something really remember. close to that. So then it rolls back, and right. then we're coming back to the ballot to say, would you like? I don't know how we couldn't get to Ryan November. Says yes. Ryan says he thinks we can get it done for November. To extend the service. I mean, we have the projects aligned with it. If, if we decide right. from Paulie's policy perspective, it, it, it goes to street development. Oh, he's talking about procedurally. He thinks right. we can get it done through the statutory requirement. The, the challenge would be whether or not we can get enough there's a strong education and awareness component that goes with it whether or not we can get the education and awareness so that the support is there i think that needs to be the goal i, I understand that's what we're looking for but yes. i think november has to be the goal for a okay. november ballot so that we don't have essentially we don't have a sunset we, okay. we it continues on without interruption and we can fund projects in 2016 otherwise we're a year out from some of the funding that is correct. these pieces and uh, and maybe not a whole year. I mean, you could do a special election well, in April you're, you're about right. or, or do something, but you're, you're longer away from getting anything accomplished. And there's a cost of the special election that we would, we would have to absorb, so you're, you're absolutely on point with I that. I think that has to be where the goal is to try to, to, to get that through, and if it can be done efficiently and effectively, then uh, from my perspective, I, I, I almost think it's without question that that's okay. the goal. I, I could be on an island, so I'm, I'm out of turn. I'm totally with you on that. But I guess my question is, if we submit the budget in August, I mean, are we going to submit that with that included? No. Or no. not? So no. So if we get the money, we still can't spend it. Yes. No. You can still spend it. You, you need to come if, back. If, if we submit a budget, we're submitting the maximum amount that we'll spend. But fund balance will be included. Yes, yeah, fund balance. Okay. So okay. probably by the time we actually get <laughs> things rolling for, because you're not going to borrow that whole $6.6 .6 right up front. 
because I don't think Brian, Brian said he couldn't tear up the whole city all at once and you can't even go that fast. So, (laughs) yeah, yeah, exactly. So we would phase it in anyway and we can match the phasing to the revenue streams. We'll, we'll get you there. Okay. Steve? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, uh, First of all, you said there was a, there was an expense shortfall of approximately almost $900,000 for general fund in this last year. And it's 662,000 of that was personnel. personnel. And they're almost all filled now. Yeah, I was going to ask how many of the, how much of that was due to unfilled positions? All of it. And that's all of it. it. All yeah, of it. So all we, of weren't, it. we weren't actually seeing a shortfall. That's not really a. No, it's real savings. It's real. Because real savings. you're not going to go back and pay those people now. They weren't here. No, you're not going to retroactively pay. Correct. I understand. But it's one, it was a one year. Right. It's a one shot. It's deal. a one year cushion yeah. that inflated your fund balance so that you're writing nicely now to cover bond and interest and the other things that we need. And, and frankly, in. thank God. Yeah. It'll yeah. be built in. Right. We can't yes. expect to achieve that twice. No, you can't. Achieve, no, that's right. No, and in a sense, I would rather that we had had those positions. <laughs> well, <laughs> sure, <laughs> but but it came out but, nicely. Yeah. To to delay them some. I'm going to give these numbers. So uh, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, water and wastewater fund consolidations. I think we had discussed that last year about creating some maybe some efficiencies of scale. I just modeled it for you. And yeah, we had talked about that. No, I mean we, that was in here. It, it really, it does. So I had talked about before carrying a, an appropriate balance in both funds. Sure. And so we actually have gone through and we've talked to the state, we've talked to Charlotte, we've talked about everything and everybody. And to combine water development with the water fund, so parent yep. fund, yep. and wastewater okay. development to the wastewater fund, that's going to be very beneficial to taking care of your utility assessment findings. So it does create some, we were driving rates a little bit with that, and it does create some efficiencies. There's really no reason, what we were doing, growth has never, that was set up to pay, growth pays its own way to track that. Yeah. It never has. No. We have always taken operating revenues, created for rates, rate increases, and moved it over. So really, it's more financial reporting transparent, it's more budget transparent, and frankly, it's easier and more efficient Absolutely. to collapse them back up. Absolutely. Um, the 8.5 percent of assessed valuation increases. Mm-hmm. Um, do you happen to have any numbers from the assessor's office as to residential versus commercial increases? Um, did they break it down that much, or did they just give you a flat 8.5? No, that's that's actually the uh, I can get that, but it's you're almost all residential. Yeah, I know. So pre, I I broke it down that way. You're pretty much it's still pretty much eight for residential. That's and most of the residential properties went up five to eight percent. So that's why your most of the residential properties in Gardner were between zero and five and five to eight. So most of them were five to eight. So that's why we got the eight point consolidated. Sure. Well I've, I've I've got some anecdotal information that states that a lot of properties went up higher than that. Uh, more there than were 10%. some the majority was five to eight. Okay. And then uh, you know we already talked about the election piece. The delinquency issues, and I understand that we are under the gun because of that. It doesn't help. And and uh, my concern is that if the, with the time frames that we're talking about with regard to collection and or seizure mm-hmm. of these properties and the due process portion of this, uh, you know, eight years, seven years for collecting back taxes, mm-hmm. uh, to me that seems to be almost uh, rewarding that kind of behavior. Uh, you know, the soft laws can get off without any kind of uh, comp- you know, without any kind of uh, penalty mm-hmm. for years and years. And my question is, is there any way, and, and again, this is more of a rhetorical question, because I know we can't really talk about, oh, you don't have an answer for this, Laura, but um, do we need to go to see if we can get some changes to statute that might be able to accelerate this process at all? I mean, is this, is this something that is, and maybe Ryan, you could, you could talk about that from a statutory perspective, about you know what we can do to maybe accelerate this process because if the if the delinquencies are that much of a problem, we're talking about millions of dollars in in, in assessments here that are not being collected. That that is a direct handicap on municipalities to be able to set their budgets. Right. Well, and it's uh, you know it's, it's surprising that it takes that long because it's also money not flowing into the county's coffers. Cause Correct. Because the county makes their money on that as well. I you know that that's that's pretty compelling to me I, you know there are some legal things that we might look at doing um, you know or could talk about 
politically. I don't know if there probably wouldn't be an appetite for it. I mean, you know, you can bring legal action against the county for a petition for a writ of mandamus to compel them to perform their statutory duties if they truly aren't um, aren't performing a, a non-discretionary non -discretionary act. I think the chances are, however, though, that um, whether or not to file legal action to seek enforcement and collection of um, unpaid taxes is, is, may well be deemed to be a discretionary act. Um, oh. I, I, <laughs> and it won't solve your budget problem for 2016. No, it wouldn't. Well, yeah. It would. But I'm thinking more of the long term sure. view, especially as we have more and more properties, as we decide that we're going to annex more properties, and we haven't talked about annexation yet. Mm -hmm. But as we have more annexed properties in the city, the, the chances rise, obviously, with, no, with more properties that we have more unpaid assessments. I, I will say that we've talked, when I first started talking about this, there was a quite a few benefit districts with problems. Really, we're down to our favorites, our favorite people. Yeah, the wrong and, yeah, and then there is some, there's basically two parcels owned by the same guy that are enormous assessments. He's never paid a penny. So for the most part, and that's the ones they're finally moving on, for the most part, that's resolved. But unfortunately, the dollar impact, so it's not so much a yeah. widespread as it is big ticket. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you're not right on point. We've, I've blown up those people's phone. And sure. Well, and we founded their desk. And, and, and you've talked to people at the county, and I've talked to, to people at the county, and by all means, Amen. Talk to John Topker, talk to Ed Eiler, talk to any of the other county commissioners. Uh, you know, if we could get them to take, you know, appropriate action to, to help the, the people in the assessor's office to fund them and, and staff them accordingly, the we, could probably, we could probably get this yeah. moving a lot quicker. But, uh, you know, that hasn't gotten us very far so far. I think so now they might respond to you that they're catching up. I think they even hired another person. But when we first started talking about this, we yeah. offered our own services if it would help. <laughs> they didn't take up on it. A lot of counties have actually had success in contracting out with, with private firms and the, you know, and even dedicating a portion of their collections to those private firms. And they've had a tremendous amount of success with that. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just thinking about that. If you have an independent collector uh, that's going out there and, and doing that work, you would end up uh, obviously, you, ha you would have a great return on that investment because of the fact that you would have higher collection rates. We have the same issue in healthcare as well. I mean, there's a lot of unpaid collections, and when you bring in those outside entities that have an incentive to be able to get those collections, you typically have much higher returns. In fact, yeah, there are, there are firms now that that's their nationwide firms, and this is pretty much all they do is collection from municipalities. Sure. Um, and, and cities and counties have had a tremendous amount of success in retaining those. Why Johnson County and Domino speak to that? So. Right. And I can't solve it for you. I'm sorry. And the other piece, Mayor, that we that I just want to make sure the governing body is aware of is there are instances <coughs> in jurisdictions where when you start to pursue it, you don't necessarily end up with money. You could end up with property, and so right. you still have the same budget issue because they don't always. Sure. Hey, so you may end up being a property owner. What? So you almost have to have some option that you're looking at. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Well, I, you know, a couple slides back, we were talking about economic development, mm -hmm. and uh, the question was kind of posed: uh, growth areas, interchanges versus downtown. Uh, I'm not. Speaking for myself, I'm wondering if we can do interchanges and downtown. Yeah, I don't think it should be either or. Okay. You don't think you should do either? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Either or. No. I don't, I don't think it should oh, be either or. Oh, proposition. Sorry. I think you could fit both if you do it right. Okay. Not to mention they're different incentive structures. Yeah. I mean, yeah. completely different different animal of business that you're going to be recruiting in those areas. I agree. So I think that, that dead on, it needs to be both. Okay. As we look at those and what we can do to work with, you know, okay. we heard in the symposium, it, it, you know, protect what you have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so we need to make sure that we're doing things that promote that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I, you know, there's there's a very good possibility, and, and some of you might have seen it on your, uh, uh, we 
weekly summary last week that there's there's some infill infill development that's that's coming mm -hmm. and, and and possibly some that will be coming towards downtown at some point in the mm -hmm. near future so mm -hmm. I mean if we get economic development I did not model sure. and I never do yeah. any yeah. significant economic impact because that would be very frightening for me to come up here and tell you later guess what we didn't get it right yeah you would no. not be pleased no. And, and no. not to mention the fact that you know we've found in the history of the last 10 or 15 years here that growth does not always pay for itself. That's right. So we can't we can't make budget expenditures based on future growth estimates. Right. It it doesn't work out that way. Right. Laura, uh, what what are you projecting our fund balance percent to be roughly? What are what are we what are we aiming for in our fund balance? When you uh, to maintain the credit rating? Yes. You need to stay in the. They wouldn't die if you were around 26, 27, but they'd be a lot happier if you were 28 and more. But they, you know, it's mostly about the next year and maybe year two. The outer years, they don't get quite as excited. They always ask, yep. but they know that those are projections. But we have committed to the credit rating people that we would stay around 30. They, they, that's what they want. And, and you're projecting us to be around 30. I, with budget. with all with I if I can keep the whole market value increase and with it with what I need to fund an interest fund, I can keep you around 27 or so, and that and actually a little higher for 16 and 17, but it dwindles down pretty quick because you got a lot of things coming on here that you have to make some decisions on. So we're in fine shape mm -hmm. if I can keep the full market increase. Now, if you don't want me to give that back. Also, uh, as we look towards not next year but the year after that, I believe the the TIF will be expiring that's, or, or be that's paid already off. in the modeling because we've known about that forever. The TIF will pay off sometime in the first quarter of 2016, which is much sooner than projected. It's been a very successful project, but that's already included in the modeling where I just gave you the fund balances because that's we've known we've been able to project that for quite some time. It never really moves much. It moves a couple months. First of all, I wish that we took detailed minutes from the work sessions only because Steve Ward used the word scuffla in the middle of a meeting. Or scuffla, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Did you hear that come out? Actually, I was like, that's fantastic. I wish that was noted somewhere other than the video so everyone would catch it. Um, I just wanted to credit that for Steve. That's a Thanks. great, great use of the SARS before the meeting. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, a question, this will be difficult, I know, because of the transition and things. Do we have an understanding of what led to $499,000 short on the wholesale energy purchase? I do not, but my solution, and Cheryl and I have talked about it, mm -hmm. frankly, we need a better working relationship with the utilities, and we'll, I, I cannot, we need a better understanding from the analysts that they've used on why that's short. I mean, wholesale electric, that's a big deal. That's the majority of the cost in the electric fund. That's a pretty big shortfall. So finance will be working a lot closer with the new director and with that analyst. Well, there were some significant electric, uh, electricity rate increases for wholesale electric over the last couple of years. Well, that could, well. could be it. So that might have something to do with it. Yeah, I really, I so honestly cannot answer that. The finance so department doesn't money. model that. Right. They were using an outside consultant for that, and we'll get with them and work a lot harder, and we'll get a liaison relationship going. I also, I question, you know, budgeting and planning and, and essentially confirming that we will move forward with a rate study on the electric side without the utility <coughs> director in place and informing the board that we've waived. I, I feel like that might be ahead of the game if, uh, or if they'll lend anything to that conversation because that'll be part of what we're looking at that is leadership from that perspective. And, and I don't know, I mean, I don't know the cost of a rate study for electric. I, we, I don't know that we've ever had one presented. So I don't know if it's, it's been something. a long time, probably 2006. That's what I was going to say, around 2006. Burns and Mac did one quite a while ago. Right. So, I mean, I don't know if those two things need to go hand in hand or if you can start one before the other. And, you know, theoretically, we'll have the utility director in place before the budget comes into play. But yeah. so that's something I just thought about there and, and wondered if the timing was right. And then the third question I had, it, it ties into the projects that have to be cash funded. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Christy's mentioned this several times. We can look at those projects and understand what the costs are. Is there a way to build in? pockets within the general fund to cash fund those over a uh, period of time and plan those costs. And is that the way we do that? Rather than saying we have to spend now and spend it this way, we plan the cost over, if it's five years, with the way the project's lined out and, and fund those through a, a 
I had, you know, I think it was a savings account. You know, you have your vacation fund. Can it be built that way from a general fund perspective where those are allocated in such? Permission to speak freely? <laughs> we did that before. And we had a CIP reserve fund. And when times got hard, we rated it and put it right back in the general fund. So all we did was tie up money, right. drive our mills higher than they needed to be. And then when it came time to do something with it, we didn't. We put it right back in the general fund because the law says you can only put it back from whence it came. Right. So we, we spun our wheels, drove mills, and didn't accomplish a thing. Do you think that you need wind in itself to do 2,000 <coughs> financial situations then where, and I understand you can't project it not to change again, but the, the grass certainly appears to be a little bit greener now and, and perhaps we wouldn't replicate the scenario, or do you think it's a, a practice that might not be as fruitful as it, it sounds in theory. I think best practice has kind of gone away from that. I think it's kind of gotten to where you, you might, we might, like I said, we would probably phase this right. over a couple of years, Absolutely. but we would just put it right in the budget rather than put it in a savings account. Okay. I've got a, a quick comment about that. When we're talking about quality of life, and I think that's the, the next slide, uh, you know, the, 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 the park trails, especially with the, the low cost for, for oil. asphalt at mm -hmm. this point, uh, I think are, are very important. Pedestrian bridges are, those have needed to be done for, for a long time and there's safety issues that, mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. involved there. And, and honestly, if we, if we go any longer and end up with my brother-in-law at the, the podium giving us a big long lecture about why that needs to be done because he's yep. literally scooped an injured child out of the, out of the ditch and, and, and taking her to the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think those are, are, are very timely and, and very much needed. However, the city gateway signs, especially since we're at a point right now where we're going to want to go to the other side of the interstate, we probably need to, to, to that's, if we're making, if we're, if we're talking policy, I think that, that we do the, the quality of life in the, in the parks, on the trails, in the greenway, and, and maybe think about the, the gateway signs for, for further down the road. I, I've never supported the, I, I just, I've never seen what return would come either from quality of life or financial you have to throw out the window, but from the gateway signage mm -hmm. itself. I think that maybe at some point there's an opportunity for you know, a private-public partnership with people to mm -hmm. participate from a funding sure. perspective, but for us to fund that, that, there's literally no way that we look at that in my perspective and say that's a good use of anyone's money. I think if you do the gateway sign as part of a larger project, like for example, any kind of uh, interchange developments where you can have those those companies maybe maybe kick in for right. a small amount, be able to do that work, or you know, pop up the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the operations campus, is, we, we decide we're gonna do something like that, mm -hmm. we can put, you know, uh, signage into that, but I don't think necessarily that that's a good, expense and I, I agree with Chris on this one. Um, one thing we didn't talk about at all in here, which is something that I think is going to be pretty important is uh, any pending land acquisitions. And I know we can't discuss details of any land acquisitions, but if we're talking about, you know, um, any kind of development on the other side of interstate where we need to have a lift station built or a plant built, um, uh, acquiring the land before the development gets there is more, is, is going to be a lot easier than getting it when the land, when the development's already taken place. And secondly, the operations campus that we've been talking about, which is you know, police, parks, and public um, uh, public works, uh, sharing a campus, which I'm assuming is going to be something around eight to ten acres, that would have to be purchased to be able to accommodate that. And those those land acquisition costs aren't included in this as well, correct? That is correct. There's no land acquisition cost that's included. One of the things that we, as part of the direction you provide tonight, mm -hmm. if you decide that you want us to look at that so that we have future opportunities to build them, mm -hmm. then there are some land acquisition strategies that I think we need to discuss in an executive session mm -hmm. so that we can, can look at that. And I'll talk with legal about that. So if that's a policy direction you provide, then we'll ask you to go into a session so always, we can talk about that. Always cheaper to, pur to purchase the land when it's greenfield than when it's got development all around it. Yeah. I, w I will say, in, I want to say that the, the trainers study said that uh, if we were doing justice center, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you were you were looking at probably a, a nine well, to six. ten acre yeah. uh, well, parcel. Uh, 
you know, so. Yeah, I, six I six acres for just the Justice Center, if we did the one the one story layout, which is short of six acres. But if you add in water, wastewater, and and public works building, now well, yeah, you I'm I'm thinking. Increase that. I'm thinking, that, yeah, it's we're probably looking at more than ten. I'm sure. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. certain. On the safe side, I mean, the more acres you buy, the less it's going to cost you per acre. Right. So. Uh, re regarding some of the uh, the pavement issues, um, <coughs> any of that you know funding options uh, like like cars program and those kind of things are those eligible for for well, those some programs? of those will be but I you submit for cars funding and stuff cars only pays for fifty percent of construction mm -hmm. and I think they've already put in their cars requests and um, I would not assume a lot but there's always CDBG and cars and the Fed fund exchange and all those things, the public works guys are really great at getting onto that, but I wouldn't look for that to be a significant. When we're talking about 6.6 .6 million over three years plus 615,000 annually, I don't think that's gonna, that's not your stop gap. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a bonus and it'll free up other money for other things, but I don't think you wanna build anything until we know something. Were you talking about the trails? No. no, no. Oh, I thought maybe you street. would get funding. This is streets. Okay. Streets funding for trails. trails. Yeah. I think from the budget perspective, you have to go with the assumption that you're going to be 100 percent responsible and then mm -hmm. both Absolutely. through the park system, green trails, and all these things, and then on the roads that you'll qualify for. So mm -hmm. just like what I mean, the, the budget expense for the intersection here was much higher than what our actual cost expense in, ended up being, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, right. the, because of the funding that we received along the way. Well, until the governing body gives direction, we don't we just put placeholder estimates and we don't start fine tuning them until you say, okay, go forth and do X. And then we fine tune and maybe estimates get better, maybe they get worse, but that's how it works. I mean, a big, a big thing um, at the federal level that funding's available for, but obviously we need to go in as you indicated, um, Councilman, that we need to be responsible, but trails mm -hmm. is an area that we certainly can pursue sure. for grant funding. So if we hear from you tonight that trails is something that we want to look at, then that becomes a priority for us as we're looking at our grants funding opportunities, but certainly we can't guarantee that money. Sure. It's just that we know nationally that's a big thing and there's money available, there's grant money out there for funding trails. Well, trails are definitely something we need to address. And so okay. we um, could pursue that. Yeah, I think that's pretty much a consensus on the body, right? That we Shows up right as a job. Problem. Every time we do yeah. a survey trail system, mm -hmm. okay. absolutely so we have to build that uh, out. I did have one quick question about the pedestrian bridges, though. My understanding, we, we, have, we had that as a project under our CIP, but now you're saying that that's not eligible. It's not eligible for debt funding. For debt funding. Yeah. So it has to be yeah. pure cash. It, yes. That's a couple hundred it, thousand dollars. It's just not feasible to do it for debt. And they were $200,000 was the yeah. roughly mm -hmm. the estimate. Correct. Mm -hmm. So are there, would there be grant possibilities for the bridges as well, maybe? Or? We, we would look at grant opportunities, what you would want to do. and. Typically, <coughs> it's going to involve a match. We generally see about a 50%, but that's still better than Money. having to sure. do it yourself. You would want to go into the budget, assuming that you're going to be responsible. We pursue grant opportunities, and when we bring it back to you and fine tune it, then we would say, much like we do with cars, we have grant funding available in this amount right. to be able to support the project. You can't, you can't bank on, but we can't, on grant funding just like no, we you, cannot. Can't, you can't forecast economic development. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that was one of, that was one of the projects specifically John <coughs> asked, could we split it up? And, and I think your feedback was, I mean, you can, but from a cost perspective, you're going to save money by doing it all at once. It, speaking of the crossings themselves, since we have two of them <coughs> that we're proposing as a project, um, the cost would go up in the sense that you're having to mobilize mm -hmm. twice instead mm -hmm. of once, essentially sure. bringing the heavy equipment in to, um, to put the abutments in and, and put the bridges in place and so forth. So it, it would be a, uh, an increase in cost. That would be a driving factor. How much exactly, I'm not certain. Okay. Can we, can we um, well, and, and I, I mean, I think this is more uh, a request. I think mm -hmm. the stormwater stuff. When I was first on council, this was big. Um, we had people come in meetings, sending emails about stormwater issues. Honestly, mm -hmm. I haven't heard a lot about it. I know we have a list of projects um, just given up. But I, I guess my no, question is, it would be nice, and Dave, I don't know if it was you or Jim Melbourne that kind of gave this overview of some of the big areas where we have drainage issues 
um, what causes those and what are some of the things to, to remediate those because if we're going to pursue and, and I'm, I'm not suggesting we do this but if we're going to, to entertain a discussion about stormwater fee mm -hmm. to me that's another thing that should be voted on and if yep. we're going to put a half cent sales mm -hmm. tax let's do the stormwater stuff but I would also be interested in if there's like where I live they did a drainage project um, and it resolved a lot of issues mm -hmm. that was part of the uh, moonlight road project as well so it wasn't anything um, additional I guess funded for the city it had to be done but but if there's pockets of areas where we see this is a prevalent problem do we have an opportunity to do a benefit district to fix those particular issues if the if the residents in that area want it versus even proposing a waste or a um, stormwater fee on everybody's bill. I, I guess I'm just looking for options and, and like I said, this is something that honestly I haven't heard a lot about. I don't know if anybody else has, but it was a big yeah. deal yeah. a couple of years ago. Oh, it's so. like a whole presentation of a list of like maybe 20 different areas and yep. get pictures and mm -hmm. right. all sorts and, of stuff. And yeah, and, and I can <coughs> tell you people used to come to meetings pretty consistently, but but they don't anymore and like I said I don't know if they've just given up or what so oh. I, I would just be interested in maybe a refresh of that of, of some information some on that issues. and options for funding that and that type of thing because if it, and if we're doing other projects if we're going to be going in and doing some other um, infrastructure projects are there opportunities for us to combine some of that together mm -hmm. sure you can always add that and all the mm -hmm. other appurtenances if we're going in and laying some water lines or some streets or whatever, Bond Council always writes in and whatever traffic signal, storm water. Sure. But you would have to, I mean, we'd have to know where we were going. Mm -hmm. I, I too like that because I like the idea, idea of pursuing benefit districts because let's say I don't have any drainage problems. I might not want to, I might vote no for a sales tax to, or to add a stormwater utility for everybody across the board, but people might be more interested in the pockets of their neighborhoods well, and that kind of thing. I, I, I would probably weigh in against benefit districts. One, there's an administrative cost to be able to manage those benefit districts. Secondly, I think that the, that the, the, the stormwater issues are, are prevalent enough around the city. I mean, they're, they're, they're all over. They're on the south side, they're on the west side, they're, on the, they're towards downtown. I mean, we've seen where they are. And there's also open culverts that are in neighborhoods where, they were, where there was uh, development that went in, developers that went in, just put an open culvert so they're very much a hazard. Um, and they take up uh, uh, portions of people's yards. Um, I think from the standpoint of just uh, taking care of our, of our drainage issues, our stormwater issues, it makes more sense to have a general type of approach, a holistic approach, rather than trying to pick and choose your benefit districts. Not to mention the fact individuals who purchased those properties didn't necessarily know that there were going to be massive drainage issues. But they're but they're going to be on the hook now for higher costs to their property tax bill because of the fact that they have, you know, th these issues that they didn't discover until they were already purchasing that property. I think from the standpoint of again, when we're talking about spreading out the cost, all right, and that's we, what we do with our property tax assessments. It's the same thing. We spread out the cost. I think that it makes more sense to have a holistic, citywide approach rather than you know picking and choosing several benefit districts to try to administer. That's just me. I mean, I don't know if, the, if your feedback is the same, but I know that there's an administrative cost for those districts. I brought it to you for a policy decision. Uh, I, 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 I'm I staying mean, out of feedback. I, I, I don't support <laughs> adding any additional fees without further for the discussion. I, oh, no, I, I agree. Mean, I agree. Yeah, I think there needs to be to, a vote. Yeah. But if there's a vote, I think it needs to be a citywide vote. No, and I, I, yeah, I agree I mean, with that. I'll tell you right now, the Parma folks and even the folks on Moonlight Road where they don't have a lot of drainage issues, I think they understand that we do have stormwater issues just a, in general around the city because of the way that our topography is so it is flat it's we'll very flat. this in a few minutes <laughs> we're opening discussion yeah so uh yeah do you have a so do you want me to walk you well you wanted to have open up the question for the full citizens full yeah let's let me stand down we'll, we'll go ahead and, and and take a seat keep the microphone mm -hmm. handy because there might be uh, uh, questions that you can handle at this point. Okay. And, and, and oh, I have one and question really quick. Not, but yeah, I have one question really quick, Chris. Um, would we be able to uh, get a, uh, a copy of the presentation uh, sent to us so we have it? The slides? This evening? Come on. Yes. 
Yes, yes. Like we it. will post it all. In fact, all of the budget presentations that we've done the next day from January, okay, even from the citizens, the next day they're posted on the city's website. So they will be posted, and we will have this uh, posted as well. Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. that's actually. I, I went and made notes. The the, the information that I talked about uh, this after the, this this evening before we got started. I mean, I just went to the city website and everything mm -hmm. that's that's being piped into the 2016 budget discussion. Uh, okay. All that all that reference material is right there. Yep. Uh, all right. So, so at this point, uh, I know we've got some, <coughs> some people that are here. Uh, maybe we're maybe we're going to get some some comments and some questions. Uh, but I certainly encourage you that if you do, take the opportunity. Uh, uh, come on up and, and, and let us know how you feel about what's been uh, presented so far and, and, and some of the discussion that the governing body said. Okay. There for a second, I didn't think we were going to get anybody. We're Thank you, Robert. Robert. We'll be first, but you want name, <laughs> address, all that? Like uh, no, that's a uh, work session, yes. so okay. we're not taking minutes. I just had a few things. Uh, the first one's probably going to make you run me out of the room. We talked the sales tax stuff and everything. I understand about uh, where you want to use the half cents possibly in the future. Uh, Ten years ago, we were at like 9.025, and I believe the state back in 2010 or 11 dropped <coughs> uh, one point something off, so it, it dropped us down to where we're at now in the eights. Um, Obviously, we talked about the half cent sales tax that we had started at a lower rate and it wasn't bringing in a lot. Now we're up to a million dollars a year. Uh, for the police station, we're looking for new funding and everything. Uh, it's iffy. We have a great community. People love and support our police department. Maybe a, a quarter cent sales tax to help fund that. Maybe run that over a, a longer period of time rather than 10 years. That's a smaller amount. Uh, that might be something, again, though, you, if we look at that, I understand we're going we're gonna to run into the issue of wealth. Are people going to want to pay uh, up the renew the, the 50 cent or the half cent sales tax and a quarter cent? Uh, even so, we haven't had a, a mm -hmm. sales tax increase in, in 10 years. I mean, we've actually had a decrease in sales tax. We're still not going to bump us over that 9% level or anything like that. I think that might be an option uh, for funding or something at least to, to, to kick around and look at. Again, people hate taxes, election year, everything else. It might get me booed out of here, but uh, I wouldn't have a problem. Uh, yeah, I'm biased a little bit working there, but I wouldn't have a problem paying that, that quarter cent sales tax. Just, just a thought. Just the the uh, two more things: the land uh, that we talked about a little bit, and, and combining maybe a, a 10 acres for uh, police and public works. I'm completely against that. I'm sorry. Uh, nothing against my public work guys that, that work here. They're great people, uh, but. I think a, a police department like City Hall is something that people look at in the community that is a really nice, attractive place, something that's that, uh, aesthetically pleasing. Uh, having backhoes and dump trucks and sand piles and salt piles and, and all that next to your, your police department, I, I don't think that's the greatest idea. Uh, maybe a, a parks and rec might be more feasible. Maybe a community center, something like that might be nicer. but. Uh, public works, I, I just personally, I don't think that's the right thing. And I think Trainer said it best. Uh, you, they're, they're where they're at now by the tracks, railroad tracks. That's usually where you see those in cities. Mm -hmm. Not saying they're, they're you know, <laughs> not, not as, <laughs> as where we are on the same level, but uh, just being being realistic. I mean, you want your, your heavy machinery and stuff like that kind of on the outskirts of, of, of your city and everything. Uh, last thing, annexation. I just noticed uh, recently 191st Street. Uh, Edgerton is now uh, up to the old pumpkin patch. I mean, they've annexed all that land there on the, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, south side of uh, 191st Street. They're, they're touching our border again now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not very educated on the annexation. I know you just can't go out and say, hey, we mm -hmm. want that land. We want it in our city and we take it. Mm -hmm. I, I get that, but I, I really wish we would uh, be more aggressive. I think I spoke before in a, a work session or council meeting about that. Be, of trying to annex some land, trying to, to build Gardner and grow Gardner uh, before we're, we're swallowed up by Olathe and Edgerton. Uh, Edgerton, well, I think we had no gentleman's agreement with them about Waverly Road. Um, evidently, we're not going to be gentlemen or, or something, but uh, you know, they're, they've definitely crossed that line and, and they're, they're taking over on that west side. Uh, we're looking at possible commercial growth on the east side. You know, now we're losing where we thought residential might be on the west side. So. I'd really like to see some, some 
aggressiveness toward annexation. Again, I don't know anything about it, how it works, but uh, I just don't want to see us landlocked like some of the northern cities. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Thank you. Hey Rob, you, you um, uh -oh. I know you've been in many police stations around the area and, yes. and you've also seen the presentation from Trainer. I mean, yes. in, from your perspective, um, what's your perspective of it? I, I mean, I'm, I'm asking your opinion. What, what, as, it, as in? As in the, uh, do you think it's too much? Do you think it needs to be scaled back? Do you think that that put me on the spot. <laughs> uh, I wish Sergeant Hollyhead could speak because he has a saying uh, about it fits perfect in this scenario about uh, we've been doing so much for so long with so little. I, I don't remember the whole thing but it's a great saying. Ask him after the meeting. Uh, but that really puts in perspective on the building and, and everything. We're growing. We're going to continue to grow. Uh, I think what Trainer la laid out uh, is is right on the money. Um, I mean, we're working in a very, very small uh, building. It, it just doesn't work. It, it really doesn't. For, for what we want to provide to the community and everything, uh, I, I think what they, they gave us is, a, is the right size. The only thing I'd say there is they, they did give us two versions, one at like 27,000 square feet, one at 33. Um, and I know there was mention of phasing you know, the courthouse in later. Uh, my, as a citizen, I, I mean, to me, that doesn't really make us, it, it doesn't seem financially responsible of us to do that because everyone knows construction prices go up over the years. So we're delaying now and we're going to be paying more later and, and that just, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And I think what they designed and how they had it laid <coughs> out, obviously not knowing what it's going to look like or anything, but what they've laid out uh, square footage wise and everything, I think it looked great. I, th I think that's, uh, it's going to give us a little bit of room to grow into, but there's still not a much there. I mean. 20, 30 years, depending on what our outlook is and our growth in our community, we may have to still add on later on, but I, I think what they gave us was going to provide us the room we need now with a, just a little bit of, of uh, room to grow into. But scaling back, uh, like I said, you maybe, I, I don't know, that's not my, my area of expertise. I know what we have now is definitely not, not adequate at all. I mean, it's just, it's just not, it doesn't work. Uh, we make it work, but it, it's not very feasible. Seeing the other agencies around uh, Paola, uh, Ottawa, uh, Leewood, and just that count, you know, they got deep pockets. Uh, you know, Leewood's a dream, but Paola is way too small for us. Uh, looking at Paola is way too small. Uh, we, I think that'd be downsizing for us almost, even though it might be a little bit more square footage than what we're in now. It just, it just wouldn't work. Did you want to did you want to address something? Well, it's a, a direct question, but but kind of uh, to your point about uh, you know expanding our boundaries and annexing, and this is something I was going to talk about I guess later, but bring it up now. But yeah, uh, you know determining what we need to do uh, infrastructure wise to get across the street, and and you've kind of brought this up um, at a meeting a few times ago, but uh, you know not saying we, we need to go out and do a, a big study and everything else, but I think we could maybe even have a work session to, to come up with basically what we need to do or an estimate of what we need to do. I think they've even got in their department, I think they have some of that actually even planned out and laid out mm -hmm. uh, for wastewater and water and those things. And just so we, you know, going into this have a, a general understanding of, of what we need to do or what we could do uh, to go across there. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, a, a cost a cost analysis plus an infrastructure slash engineering uh, workup is really what we would want. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, but but staff. I mean, done by staff. I mean, I'm not sure. sure you didn't Absolutely. Go out and and it, it and it doesn't. I mean, I'm not asking for you know a, a, a detailed um, to the to the penny study, <laughs> but to, to give us a better idea of, of what it would take. Mm -hmm. You know, this. These are some estimates of cost that could be, you know, if you're interested at all, it's going to be, you know, you've got to be looking at this amount and, and to do these things, um, and then we can decide, okay, yeah, we are, we might be interested. Let's proceed further with it. Yeah, I mean, it's good to have the information, and and, and when you're talking about that whole interchanges versus downtown dynamic with regard to economic development, the infrastructure component needed to get across the interchanges to the other side of I-35 is something that doesn't exist for downtown. That's that's unique to that 
part of economic development. So. Yeah. Do, oh. uh, well, I was just going to ask, and, and this is probably more to Cheryl. Do we do we have an option? So, so we we'll use um, 175th and I-75 in the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have an annex, annex property on the side of I-35 as well as on the other side of I-35, mm -hmm. um, kind of by the Coleman area as well. So I, I guess my question is. Um, <coughs> The, the struggle that I have for, for building infrastructure is that you're building infrastructure to unannex un land. Mm -hmm. So basically you're spending money for people who aren't paying property tax to you. Um, and, and they could still make the decision not to mm -hmm. annex to Gardner. So, but do we have an option? Um, are, are there capabilities for us to go to those property owners and basically say, if, if you annex to Gardner tomorrow, will over a time frame provide infrastructure to your property and oh because quite frankly if i'm a property owner i'm not going to annex because my property taxes are going up so i'm going to wait or but are there do we have some options to negotiate and basically say with no infrastructure there i mean with no development going in there your property taxes <coughs> remain flat you annex to us and over whatever three months we'll build infrastructure there so basically an annexation agreement with the property owner for them to annex if we put in the infrastructure. Well, or they annex and then we put in the infrastructure. And we agree to basically not raise the taxes to the city. You know what I mean? They would just right. continue to pay the same rate as tax. I, I guess that's my question. You're, you're wondering if we can defer. The overall, if we can the overall right. deferred impact of tax revenue. Well, I think what I think probably the mechanism. There, there are different ways you could look at it, but I think I mean, there, there are any number of economic development tools you could employ mm -hmm. to do that to get that done. Um, but you you could do. I mean, you know, I think all the all the land over on that side of the interstate is pretty much all ag land, right? Right. Yes. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So I mean, if you just did a ten-year property tax abatement. Um, then, th then their their taxes would be abated. Now they would have to pay. Well, it depends on. Yeah, I mean they would probably have to pay the mill levy rate on their base valuation yes. because we can't give them the we can't give them the abatement um, until until they're in the city. Um, so they would have to pay mills on you know what's ag land. Right, that 1,500 an acre or something like that. Right. Um, so it wouldn't be much money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you and then to to get them to agree to annexation, particularly with ag land, it's almost the only mechanism you can use because um, you know unilateral annexation of ag land, meaning unilateral, meaning you as a governing body doing it. Um, is is almost impossible. The only the only two mechanisms are with the landowner's <coughs> consent, mm -hmm. or if you go to the board of county commissioners to have them it basically impose upon the the landowner that they're going to come within the city. And you can imagine how popular that be in front of the board. Of county right, county and, and I I would have want to. I mean, I would definitely want it with the landowner's right. consent. But what I would want is I would want that that agreement in place, basically mm -hmm. that. Well, I, what I would like to pursue is can we get the annexation completed with an agreement that we would provide infrastructure to that land? I mean, that's yeah, that that's a that required be, that's a required piece. Plan. Yeah. But but what I'm saying is, it, okay, so if I am a property owner out there and I'm just paying county property tax today. Mm -hmm. I am not going to agree to annex that land. I don't care if you tell me you're going to build infrastructure there, build it. You know, I, I'm not going to pay a, a higher tax rate until I absolutely have to, until somebody agrees to buy it. Basically. Well, what about what what about this? Um, maybe not because there's not a lot we can do with regard to assessments when it comes to, for example, ag property. But there are some things that we can do with regard to credits. So we can so we can set up a credit mechanism well, that's whereby we rebate or refund certain aspects of that collection through economic uh, development uh, incentives. Exactly, that's, that's part your of your credit. But there's no, but what I'm saying is there's nothing there. You know what I mean? I mean yeah. we're incenting 
no development that's okay. works since then Future. is a land owner. That's you, but what you're doing is you're looking at what you then would be yep. looking at is mm -hmm. of your general fund money. Because when you develop an economic development policy, you can decide what you want to incent and what you want to do in terms of a catalyst. So if you want to, even though there's nothing there, you would view that as kind of a, an investment on a fut for future returns that you see getting once that property is developed. Yeah, I mean, you can go ahead. You, th and there are so do. many economic development tools sure. that you can craft <laughs> anything and put and put anything together. You, you, you could write them a check out of the general fund. That's right. You yeah. Get cash. I'm not really going that far. But you, could, <laughs> but you could get to providing something because remember, here's the other piece that you have. Part of why we were talking about the incentives and the symposium is you have utilities. And so water and you and have water. water, you've got wastewater, you've got electric. So if that's the direction that you'd like us to be going, then what we want to look at is what's the appropriate to and what are the options? Mm -hmm. What kinds of things do we look at to be able to do what you just asked? Because you have options. Yep. Yeah, and I guess what I, I'm just trying to lay out is I, 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 I don't, I'm not saying I'm adamantly opposed, but I'm mm -hmm. leaning, I, I think that we should have an annexation before we invest in the infrastructure. Yeah. Okay, so I, I mean, mm -hmm. but I don't oh, think no, that's I agree. what everybody was saying. I mean, I think no. some people were saying, no. We'd build infrastructure there and hope no. they annex no. later. No, no I don't think that's the another case city. Because you could end no. up right. not having them annex in your city. Right, exactly. Oh, no. I, and I, that's not what I meant to say. What I meant to say when I was talking about moving utilities across, and the reason why I, I, meant, I brought it up is because it takes time. It takes time to get that infrastructure across. It, you know, you're not going to be putting shovel to dirt and, 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 drilling, and drilling tunnels and boreholes, you know, tomorrow. But you got to start the process of getting your plan into place, get your engineering studies done, get your land acquisition strategy for for for, for um, things like uh, uh, lift stations and and, and, and and water plants. We need to put a water plant in. You got to get that planning done well in advance. I mean, you're talking two to three years of just of just planning before you can even get that stuff done. And so what I was saying is get that started. Because if you don't get it started now, tomorrow you're going to be one day later. Next month, you're one month later. Next year, you're one year later. And now we're, we're out of the game completely with regard to development. Well, and some of this is going to go back to collaborating with mm -hmm. people that are around us, whether, it, whether mm -hmm. it's Water District 1, whether it's Rural Water 7, whether it's Johnson County Wastewater, whether it's the new Olathe Wastewater plant, Treatment Plant that's being built at 159th Street. We've got options and we've got partners that we can collaborate with and, and, and entities that we're you know, fostering relationships with so that, so that if an opportunity that presents itself like the Big Bull Creek wastewater treatment plant comes up, we're going to be able to, to move forward on something like that. And uh, yeah, that's, I think Christy's right, I think Steve's right. I'm not sure that there's anybody that's suggesting that we, we build infrastructure on the other side in, in hopes that people no, are going no. to come, but but the planning that goes into it, including I mean what what Bruce Kimmel from Ellers spoke mm -hmm. about at the mm -hmm. at the uh, uh, economic development symposium about having an economic uh, not, not, not an engineering it's feasibility it's studies absolutely. so that we can hit the ground running. Uh, I think that's important, Todd. I, I think that what you were suggesting earlier about about having staff do it is is a step in the right direction, but my guess is that we're probably going, and nobody likes to have studies, but at the same time, we can, we can either have studies or we can hire staff. And I've had this conversation with yep. the, the city administrator, and she'd love to have the staff. You've got a lot better control over staff members. Uh, uh, you've got, you, you can spend a lot more time directing them exactly the way that you want, uh, but, uh, you know, you, you hire a staff member this year, you're going to pay them next year and the year after and, year and after. so on and so forth. Uh, so, you know, that's probably another policy decision that we, we might need to make is do we want to, <laughs> do we want to hire people or, or do we want to, or do we want to engage local, uh, 
local firms that, that specialize in this kind of thing. Well, I think it's kind of driven by revenues, Chris. I mean, right now I don't think we have the revenues, frankly, to be able to support, you know, large expenditures on personnel right now. When, when and, and so, and so it agree. makes sense. It makes sense to, to a certain extent, bring in for those large, for those larger one-time hits, like an engineering study for infrastructure across the interstate to hire a firm. I hate saying that because I know, you know how I love how I love consultants. But it makes some sense given the fact you don't have to pay that additional cost until we get the development in place where we can start to be able to self fund through our own personnel departments. Well and there are some there are some things. I mean we're doing things already that are reasonably under the radar. Uh, uh, some sub area planning that's that's happening for around the intersection. I mean the inter interchanges, uh, uh, but you know until uh, until we've actually had a chance to uh, interact with the the property owners, uh, uh, having a, a reasonable conversation about what that's going to yield. Yeah. Uh, that's something that we've kind of got to let play out. But we're going to have some some answers about that probably in you know April or May. Uh, oh. I I, but I, I guess I was just looking for more big picture. Mm -hmm. You know, th these are some options. Like, you, you, you know, if you want to get across, um, you could tie in here. You could tie in there. We could we could come across under the highway. Some of those things, just so you, you know, mapping it all out in, in a general sense. Um, sure. You know, nothing nothing to the infinite engineering study. But I'm saying just a, just a general. Let's have a discussion about it. Here's some options. Here's some things we can be looking for, and then we can decide. Yeah. And, and there's and there's some benefit from the standpoint of communications to those folks that are on the other side of the interstate that have the land. If they see that we have we're serious enough about this that we're actually putting out some 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 skin to do the actual uh, you know studies, tells them hey these guys these guys are gonna are gonna actually deliver on this. The the annexation part is really concerning to me. It's on, in every area that we have another city coming with us and I think we're going to have to be creative because for one we're, we're kind of working against, against our tarnished reputation a little bit and but we're going to have to be creative and so I like the idea that Christy said we need I don't want to build it there until we've got an annex but maybe we can do some sort of credits or what you know what we were talking about but I think we're going to have to be creative Absolutely. and aggressive to keep but our boundaries. Yeah, our the, boundaries. Other, the other thing that is going to be key, I, I mean, this is my personal opinion, especially on some of this land that's kind of on the outside of town. Mm -hmm. We, and I'm just going to preach this again, we have things internally we have got to fix because mm -hmm. the landowners may annex. If a developer comes in and buys that land and says, or some of the things that we're seeing today, we're not going to buy this land unless you apply for the annexation yeah. and go somewhere else. So, so this we have we have to address the issues internally that are that whether it's perception or not. Somehow we have got because yep. nobody's going to annex their land well, and tie their hands thinking that a developer is not going to buy it because. Well, and I, I think that that speaks to implementation for the economic development strategic plan, uh, making sure that we implement some of the things that we've done there. And then the other thing is, we should have an economic development policy for consideration yeah. next month, which is, is going to, to speak volumes to the people that are in uh, the, the areas that haven't been annexed yet. Uh, yeah. And, you know, the, the faster we get, I mean, that's, there's going to be other pieces, it's going to, you know, economic development is going to be an evolutionary process, but if we can get a, a policy approved, and the sooner the better, it's it's going to uh, well position us in a, a much better way for development on the other side of the interstate. And then there's two things, and you know, with all my discussions that I've had with folks in the business community, developers and real uh, commercial real estate folks, two things that they keep coming up with, and the two things they say are the biggest problems we've got with this city are codes, code enforcement, and permitting. Mm -hmm. Those are the two bugaboos that they've been having to deal with, not just for the last couple of years. This has been a decades-long issue, okay? And some have had more appetite for the, you know, uh, the rigmarole that we've had to put those folks through 
than others, and those individuals have, you know, d done some development. But we've actually heard from some at the symposium mm -hmm. and at the uh, development task force meeting. They're not in, they're not willing to take those risks anymore. They're not willing to. They don't have that appetite anymore. And 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 so we've got to fix those things. And those are things. Those are internal cultural things that we can address, and not, you know, it's it's not a, that's not necessarily a money thing. It's a process thing, and and that's I think what you're talking about, isn't it, Christina? That's yeah, that's. That's really what it comes down to. It's not really more of a, it's not money. You can't throw money at that. You've got to, you've got to actually, you know, begin to change the culture, and keep it from being more, less of an enforcer. And I, 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 I agree in enforcing law. Don't get me wrong, but I think there's a way to enforce law that you don't become the bad guy, and ways you can facilitate, you know, first and enforce second. Does that make any sense? Yes, it does. I think we're less of a facilitator and much more of an enforcer, and that turns people off. I know, and some of this stuff is already underway. I mean, that, I, it, it just is. We we approved as a governing body in December uh, some concurrency approval processes that shave six weeks off of uh, the uh, the approval time. That's and and the the land development code's already in the the process of. Uh, of of moving forward, so I mean we're taking care of those things, uh, but instead of instead of uh, continuing the, this kind of conversation, maybe we can get back to the, yeah. the policy considerations. Uh, I think we've kind of gotten through economic development and and quality of life. Uh, what's the what's the next uh, one that was was up? Was it uh, fiscal stewardship or? Infrastructure and asset management. Can we get a different slide up? I think everybody's. I, I think the consensus of council is we should be talking about trying to get a referendum together about the half limb sales tax. Half of which would be part of what would go towards uh, uh, the six point six million dollar okay. three year mm -hmm. right. uh, well, project. I had asked if we could have more. And then Rob came up and said maybe we could have more for the police station and sure. I would I would be well, I think, in that. I think so too. I think though what we would run into a challenge there is the the, the justice center is a much bigger proposition. It'd be more difficult. It, you have to have a plan in place like with the aquatic center. This is what it's going to be, here's where it's right. going to be, here's what the cost we're we're quite a ways away from that, I think, still with the Justice Center. You don't know really where we expect it to be. You don't have finalized construction plans. So I absolutely think that is going to be the best way of funding that project. I just don't think it's going to be in time for the November referendum we'd like to have for road improvements, which I think we all uh, be consider to be a good approach for next year. I think it has to be a separate thing, but I think there probably will, will be as we look at that and look as a comparison of the sales tax, an opportunity to look at, um, you know, Laura, you know, uh, Rob did a great job summarizing. He, he touched base. Laura touched base on it when we talked about the project. That's something you finance for 20 years. So we may look at that as a smaller tax increase over a long period of time to make it a little bit less of an impact on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think we've got to go that road. I, I just don't know how you fund that project otherwise because when you finance that large, it's going to hit that fund now. It's, it's going to either be a mill every or it's going, to, it's going to be taxed, that fund. That there's, there's just no other way to get to it. So I think that's the best way to get there. But the, the project itself is going to take longer to put together than yep. what we want to do on the road system. Yeah, the other, uh, I, I think that he's absolutely right on that. Uh, you know, so we've got maintenance projects and those are sustainable new facilities. Mm -hmm. We're just probably not quite there yet. Right. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, talking about rate increases uh, or, mm -hmm. or more correctly, talking about our rate assessment study. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's something that we need to work with with the new utility director, and, and maybe we need to be checking that with water and wastewater as well. Maybe we can do uh, all three of them at the same time, or, or maybe, you know, without the new utility director, and I know that we're getting close, uh, uh, without the new utility director in place, we're, we're uh, at this point, I, I think that if we haven't done a study since 2006, an independent outside study, mm -hmm. it's it's time for another one. Uh, is there anybody that uh -huh. doesn't think that? 
I'd actually, I'd be interested, I, I, I know, I'll put, uh, we've got one member here tonight, but uh, from from the EUC itself, or UAC, that's what I said. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, <laughs> you know, I like to see what their input, I know absolutely. they literally, this is absolutely what their job is. Uh, yeah, we've put on to them, and there was work done prior the, to the transition to how the new plan is in place and, and where they are on, on the, the rate thoughts and such, and, and yeah. maybe, you know, maybe there are, is more complete data that we just haven't been presented. There's been a disconnect in communication. I, the partnership. I do think it's, we talked about the liaison and the right. partnership and getting more involved with it because we don't know. Uh, and what we don't know is, what we do know is that the shortfall came up pretty darn big. Right. And I cannot tell you what the deal is. So we're going to have to work together one way or the other with the utility advisory committee and the finance department and the director when they come. Right. We'll all get together, but I, I'm not sure I heard clarification on the rate study for all three or. Well, what I'm saying actually is, as much information as you don't have, it's equally what I don't have, and I'm not ready to say from a policy policy perspective. I'm ready to engage in this right now. I think those lines of communication need to okay. to be open, and, and there's the conversation. I don't know, you know, as the department, financial, and all these things. You know, there's a lot of this that happens more that we just. Thank you for your efforts and don't really understand that piece of it as well. Well, I think the conversation there needs to be had and we, and we get feedback on that end to complement both sides of it. So we have more than just, we haven't done it since 2006. Well, okay. I could be all wet, but I have a hard time believing that nothing's been done since then. So what do we have actually that we just don't have tonight? Well, we've, we've had internal stuff since 2006. Right. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, what I would suggest maybe, and, and this seems to be a problem more specific to electric, mm -hmm. uh, you know. While we're while we're in the the process of of getting the new utility director on board and him getting up to speed with the uh, finance department and and the utility advisory commission, is that maybe we put a placeholder in for an electric rate assessment study, and, and that way, if you know the utility director and the mm -hmm. UAC come forward and say. We don't really need an independent study, then we don't have to put that in the 2016 budget. Yeah, uh, uh, my understanding is that they were underway with a rate study before all that happened at the end of last year, um, or the middle of last year when the EUB went away. Um, uh, I had discussions with the chair of that of the EUB at the time, and they said that they were about two thirds of the way through a utility study. Uh, a rate study for electric, and they didn't complete it uh, for obvious reasons. Um, I would love to be able to see what you know what they had come up with before. Uh, at least give us a starting point. Um, if we want to then take it to an outside contractor, that's fine. But I wanted to at least see what they had gotten started with. My understanding is that they had put a significant amount of time and effort into that up until that point, uh, along with the, the uh, electric director at the time. And so. I think that's what you're talking about, isn't it, Heath? I mean, you had heard the same thing. I thought I, I understood that there was some things that they were yeah. working on. I just don't know where it got left. But no. you know, it, it, and we do need to know that because if we do decide to engage an engineer, they may not start from ground zero. They may have enough there to start from, you know, Absolutely. step two of this five-step process, and that could save us tens of dollars, maybe. <laughs> no, and that's <laughs> tens, I think. And I, I, I agree with everything that both of you have just said, but I, I do think. The, of having a placeholder for, you know, Wouldn't as hurt. study money. Yeah. No, I, I, no, I think no. no. So I, I don't disagree with that at all. Okay. Well, it, well, and one of the things that I would ask, and I, I don't know, I mean, I know in, in our utility business, the same people that would do a type of rate recommendation study are the same type of people who would also do a cost benefit for infrastructure. So if we can somehow lump those mm -hmm. two together, mm -hmm. Um, and get some sort of break as a result yeah. of it, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. the engineers that would do that would have the ability to give you some of that as well. Okay. You know, and that'd be, you don't want to ask for too many things all at once, but it'd also be a great thing because they'll be able to lend on for experience and say, if you drill under and you, you run to here, this is what one large warehouse will do from a, an electric capacity and what it might have an impact from a rate perspective when you add, you know, 300 acres of, of commercial development in a, a large big box and, and small retail. This is what we see that as from a rate impact when you have that large a volume 
back on your grid. You're right. They'll start to look at your load factor and tell you what that means and how that impacts. And that's an important component because that also helps you with what you need to plan to buy in terms of power. So you, they're going to be able to give you better planning. Plus, they're going to be able to take the assessment and factor all of that together and give you a much better snapshot with the utility director for utilities. Hey, one thing I wanted to mention, I know we're going way back here into the, pub the public safety and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to uh, address the officer's concern about public works and salt stacks and heavy equipment. I don't think that that was ever the intention of having that within the same campus. The, the intention, I think, was that we were going to have separate facilities. It was, we looked at parks and public works. Yeah, one was going to be for, um, for the, the, the Justice parks and Center the parks and rec building and some limited limited fleet storage right. would occur on the other end of the property in the back so they wouldn't see that from the road all right I just remember you saying campus and it's a campus was mentioned so that's the, the vision yeah and tail oh no no that was never the intention yeah that We're was never the intention there. the intention was that we would have administrative right. and operational facilities for our staff as yeah. well as the police and potentially even additional uh, a vehicle storage for other jurisdictions potentially um, uh, for law enforcement on that property. So that just to alleviate your concerns there about that, because yeah. I don't think we want those there either. <laughs> Are we ready to move on to yes fiscal fiscal um, stewardship? Uh, I think that we are I, 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 think so. yeah, I think we've kind of talked about. Mm -hmm. yeah all three of these things already so yeah, what I heard was I get to keep the valuation increase because you need it for bond and interest you are interested in pursuing the half cent or more sales tax and yeah. stormwater fee not so much till we revi review where we are and that sort of thing revisit that is that what I heard and the whole driver for bond and interest is the fact we've got those delinquencies and assessments it's pretty much what's running it yep, yep. yep. You, you can afford your small maintenance projects my, what I heard was go ahead and build those in because it just delays things if you don't but if you want new funding that's what we just talked about yep. for the new facilities and then and probably what I'll do is delay the the uh, debt service payments push them back a little bit a year or so because we're not ready basically not yet sure sure and the other question about the the, the sales taxes I think statutorily we're limited to 10 years is that is that not correct I'm I mean, up, buddy. I for, don't know. For, yeah. a, for a municipal, yeah. for a municipal uh, referendum or assessment, I, I wanted to go back and look at the statute because yeah, at some point in time they they amended it to um, basically provide that any sales tax that has been passed yep. has to be ultimately has to be repealed, and I, I have to go back and look at whether or not that provision applies to the sales tax that were passed with a specific sunset on them or not so yeah, I thought that I thought that in that. Kansas and uh, I, I'll, I'll probably need to go back to my folks at the legislature to ask them but I thought that statutorily for municipal assessments of sales tax special sales tax assessment that you were limited to a 10-year sunset the basement but, limited to 10 years. right but yeah you know the county the county actually now maybe the grandfathers the county has some public safety sales tax that have no sunset yeah i mean there, so there, i don't there know there used to be a specific sunset but at some point in time there was a, a legislative change to that and i just have to go back and look yeah this was passed with a specific 10-year sunset with it with the effect on that sure because you i mean you can't uh, the logic would be that you can't put an issue to the voters that it's going to have a specific sunset in 10 years and then basically pull the rug out from under sure. and let it extend. Well, I think there was a definition in the statute of a differentiation between uh, a base assessment, which would be for like public safety and things like that, versus a special assessment, which is something that would be done at the at the municipal level for things like a you know a, a community well, center, for example. Well, yeah. well, you can you yeah. can we'll email us about yes. about that down yeah. the road, Claire? Good evening. I think you had a, a question or it a is. comment. for Laura. I'm sorry. The when you were doing the uh, brief, the I think it was 1.5 or whatever. What was the budget for the police department? Uh, uh, the top, it, let's say 
1.5, but you said no. a 10% number. In oh, 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 okay. Oh, the, we were talking about values versus ROI? Right. Okay. Or is that just for the police department or? Uh, that was an example of okay. values don't necessarily have right. return on investment. That's, okay. the, that's the policy decision on we want a safe city, we want a police department, but they sure as heck don't pay for themselves. Right. And you probably would be unhappy if they were writing enough court fines to pay for themselves. Well, I, I <laughs> did a quick Google search and uh, found that we're the lowest rate in the county. So that's for court $45. Right, and we have So this is there a way to increase that and have the people that are disobeying the laws pay for that? So, so down, right. so just it's still down, not going to pay for right, itself. No, back but it's going to be, it's going to increase more than ten percent. However, 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 there's always a however. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> your judge doesn't have to assess it. Correct. So any, so if you start making it, so you get into this thing about if you make it so hard on people to pay, then they don't pay, then they skip court. Then you chase them and you tack on a failure to appear and you just keep this vicious cycle going to you land them in jail and then you get to pay for that. Okay. So there is, I mean, we have looked at it. We occasionally increase them. We could, we could double it and it still wouldn't pay for what we need it to, right. but it, it's certainly something we can always look at and that's a policy decision, but. I think we, in, we increased them. We did. Just last year. And, and we did, we've done the court cost. It's been a little while. Right. Um, the judge, it gives Rob, heartburn. Robin Lewis is, is sensitive to, she is, you right. know, to to creating a vicious cycle. There, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And then the other issue you've got is that demographically, again, our income course. levels, right. our socioeconomic Woody. structures here in, in Gardner versus other areas of the county, like, for example, Leewood, um, are, 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 are so out of whack. We're so low, much lower. It doesn't support that kind of a rate right. for, for fines, corporate fines. I mean, I, pay, I, I will, I, in full disclosure, I've, I've been stopped for traffic in Leewood. And, Whew. Uh, <laughs> well, and they also then again, make the news if you get to be one of those cities in Missouri yeah, that uh, yeah, starts doing agree. speed traps and stuff, yeah, and then absolutely. they get all kinds of excited and you get to be on KCTV5. I don't know. I mean, it's, about, it's all a policy balance. Right. Well, right. Mission, yeah. Mission Kansas this last year yes. was, was, in, was in hot water about, about their tickets. You know, and if you actually look at the, the budgets for the previous years, the court costs themselves it's a very small mm -hmm. line item in the budget. Right. So even doubling, it doesn't make a very grand, because that, that had come up in conversation before I look at it, and or I, I don't have it in there. I've it's, split up quickly, but it's yeah. I mean, less than two hundred thousand dollars, I think. It, it's it's about three hundred thousand now. Three yeah. hundred. Yeah. It's one of those things. You, you've got direct ROI, which is okay. Let's see what your bottom line is coming back to you versus indirect ROI. What's indirect ROI? That's your quality of life. Mm -hmm. That's your that's your satisfaction with your community. Uh, schools, I tell you right now, schools don't pay for themselves. But if you have good schools, you get more development, you get higher demographics, more people coming in, more taxpayers, higher level of housing come in, commercial development comes in, but that's years down the road. That's not something that comes immediately, and it's nothing you can really quantify. Right. All right, but that's but that's your indirect ROI. Now, and Mr. Marcus talked about that yep. at the Economic Development Symposium. Yeah. So, 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 I mean, I, we're so we're kind of at the the, the end of the, right? the policy consideration. Okay. Make one more time. Okay. Do you, do you so want to recap, Maura? I think do we, we do. Actually, I, I, I've got a. We got if we've got somebody like else, come on up. Sure. Randy, good evening. Good evening, Mayor. Before we move on to that kind of that uh, closing item, I wanted to go back to electric. Uh, and as a former UAC Commission member, um, we did a base rate um, in the previous past or in the recent past. And prior to that, when Bill Krawcheck was here, uh, we had probably about a 50% study on the electric rate. And I think that David and or you know the new director that's coming in. Would probably be able to provide that to you and it's 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 a travesty that you guys don't have that already I mean I when I was sitting on the other side as a EUB member I always said that we should be able to share this part and parcel um, on the operating operating side of things we have two lines that are already over there so Councilman uh, mm -hmm. Freeman we've already got two lines that are over there right. okay um, the last thing I wanted to talk about that Councilman um, Shute brought up was 
the culture and processes that you spoke of, and I think this is a great example of that, in that we have this culture between two different entities in which we're all under the same umbrella, and we, you, need to hold that group, whether it's the Planning Commission or the UAC Commission, et cetera, et cetera, hold them accountable, just as we talk about holding the Southwest Johnson County EDC accountable, because there's dollars involved, but nonetheless, holding them accountable and making sure that you get the meeting minutes and the recommendations from that group would allow you to act on it in today as an example. And I just think it's a great travesty that, that you're not able to do that. So the question that I would part with is how is council going to change that culture and process to initiate that partnership that we all talk about? We talk about it at the coffee shop. I hear you talking about it up here tonight. I know the mayor has done, you know, um, or had some effort in doing that uh, when we talked about BPU and going kind of like uh, Councilman Freeman spoke of kind of the, the 2.0, the U, uh, EUB, excuse me, EUB. But I really challenge, I really challenge each council member and mayor to change that culture and that process. Case in point, EUB, you guys should have that information tonight. Whether it's 50% done or 100% done, that would allow us, you know, the wherewithal to make better decisions, understand if we do need to bring in a consultant or we can self-perform in-house. That's just, that's just really bothersome to me. So I just wanted to get that out there. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Reed. You want to recap, sure? Can you make sure we got them all together? Okay. So let's go back to the first section of the first one, please. I'll we'll make sure we have what we we have. Okay. So what we heard in the growth areas is that we're going to look at the interchange and downtown. What we heard was that we want an estimate of the infrastructure to cross the interstate. Under promoting economic, economic development, we also heard that we want to look at the half cent sales tax for a November time frame referendum if possible. Let's go to the next one, please. Under quality of life, what I heard was trails is a priority. So you'd like for us to look at trails as a priority. And bridges. I guess. Including, and, the bridges. including bridges, okay. Right. And we'll chase grants. And we're going to chase grants. But, right. but right. we'll budget as if we're not going to get them and we're going to assume okay. that we're fully responsible right sure. then anything that we get we'll back off right. right okay can we go to okay under uh street what we heard is that back to the other half of that sales tax we're going to look at that for november maintenance projects we're going to include those in the cip because they're sustainable but that the new facilities the justice facility and parks and public works that we're going to have to be looking at new funding sources at a later time frame because we're not quite there. And actually, we are not right there. But okay. I wonder if we don't need to, there's going to be expense to get there. Yes. I wonder if we don't build, if we don't look at building that into the 16 budget so that we can make, we can move the next step. I mean, every year you don't do that. So you build the budget in to find out what that is going to be for the Justice Center. So if we do need to have another referendum for a sales tax initiative, we have the work done. Okay, because good. Because if you don't budget it, then you put it out to the next year, and then you have, can't have the referendum done because you don't have all the groundwork laid to be able to put together the full referendum. Okay, so good point. Let me ask you something. Should we be looking, because a big component, when you start talking about how much money you need, is we have no land. So should we be dealing with land, land acquisition, acquisition and coming yes. back to you all to talk about a strategy Absolutely. for land acquisition and we put some money in the budget for land acquisition. I think we should probably have an executive session on that sooner <coughs> rather than later. Okay. Options. So yes. so then what I heard then under new facilities is we're going to go to talk about land acquisition and we're going to try to build a budget for land acquisition. Yep. Yes. Okay. All right. So under utilities, oh wait, and I, and I think, Cheryl, what I also heard was perhaps more than a half cent total. I mean, you wanted to talk about a Right, but we're not going to put that in. No, until I don't not think yet. For 2000. We're not there yet. Okay. I don't yeah. think we'll yeah. be able to put that we're in. Not I would, 16 would just kind of deal. Yeah. I, would almost, I would almost target that for a mail-in ballot election in 2016. 
after we deal with land acquisition. I don't know how much land acquisition okay. because yeah, okay. we'll because that's a huge component. You have to tell. Yes, you have to be able exactly. to say this is what. So it's we're not going to factor that in the 16 budget work that we're doing because we're going to focus on the land acquisition component. So I'm going to push need. it back a little. Yes. Okay. So um, I'd rather let's go do that and, and be proactive and get everything out and ready okay. to go. Land. Yep. Okay. So we're going to go to utilities. So what I heard under utilities is that we're going to have a rate study placeholder in conjunction with the utility director and we're going to have the utility director gather information from the UAC. Yes. Yes. In conjunction. In conjunction, yes, with the utility director. Okay. I would uh, be asterisk. I'm not sure how long that, I know we are nearing the final stages. We don't need to wait till he's there to engage the UAC. Uh, no, we'll gather some information. So, uh, you know, you had mentioned the utility director work with, uh, the city mm -hmm. administrator work with to get that information. Okay, so we'll gather that information. So What's that available we can at least, now? Right, we can at least provide what we have now. Yeah, Good, that's correct. Okay, great. and then when the utility director, I want to make sure that we're not starting a rate study absent the utility director. I think that's very fair, but we can okay. get the, the information that exists. Okay. That. Okay. And we talked about a liaison relationship and we're, already. And, and we're going to be looking at finance and looking at our staffing to make sure that we develop the liaison so that we don't have what we saw on those slides again. So we're going to be bringing you some recommendations for that as we look at that. And that's kind of the culture change. And that's too. part of the culture change. Process, what we heard from the public process and culture and making sure that you get that is that we develop a stronger relationship and liaison. Okay. Uh, last one. The last one? I think we're pretty much. Okay, we're going to keep the full eight and a half valuation because we need to put that in the bond and interest fund because it's not sustainable without that. And then. We've already talked, we've about, already talked about half about that. Yeah. And we're not going to deal with the stormwater fee. We are going to come back and do a review of the stormwater issues. And so we're going to have Public Works come back and give you a recap and a review of stormwater issues. What's not up here that I heard from you all tonight is the need to look at an annexation strategy as well. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Okay. We didn't have that here, but I have that in my notes. And that's, that's a high priority item. And we'll put that under Echo Dev. You want to go back and put it in there? Just, Thank you. I don't know that it really cost anything, though. Right, that's what I'm saying. Well, I don't know that right. it, well, yes, we don't have not. today. You know what I mean? So we, have some work, we have some work done on that. You'll recall what we did is um, about a year and a half, shortly I got here, one of the things that we did is we looked at several areas. We have about five or six areas around the city that we looked at that could be our potential priority annexation areas. We've got some high level yeah. order of magnitude of what it takes to go into those areas and provide services per statute. When you do annexation, you have to have a service plan. Absolutely. And so what we did is we did some high level analysis of what it might take to go into those areas in terms of roads as well as uh, water, wastewater. So what I think we'll probably do is pull that work back out. We can tell you the acreage okay. of that and we can do an update of that for you. That and then we can go from there and see what else we need. Does that include the Southeast Quadrant? It does. It's not very detailed. It's high level work. It's, sure. it's basically, it's internal. So it won't answer all of the questions, but it'll give you enough for us to at least have some further dialogue. Okay. Well, it'll provide okay. direction. It's good, right. Yeah. It's, it doesn't have all the details. And we're doing those property meetings. This is right. And we have the first one scheduled. First Monday. Yes. So maybe we'll get some more information from that. So I, I would like to almost kind of have um, probably about 60 days on that because we have that meeting and I'm not sure what we're going to hear from that meeting. So we may need a second meeting before we're really ready to have some dialogue. We'll have a better feel after we meet with the property owners. So I'd like to just um, have a little bit of time to work through that before we commit when that will come back to you. Right. Yeah. You know, I will say, I, I, I feel like, you know, we've got challenges. Every city's got challenges, but we've got, we've got some, some good things going as far as uh, our, our current finances, mm -hmm. our capacity uh, uh, for uh, debt and, and, and honestly, I mean, the city's in a really good place. I was chatting with Heath earlier today and uh, there was a insert that came out of the, the Kansas government journal uh, right in the middle uh, that talked about uh, tax rates for cities across the state and Heath, what was, where did we sit with cities of the second class? I mean, well, we have 
think the 102nd highest out of 108 cities in the second class, that was on the 2013 or 2014, not 2015. So in cities there's no levy, sorry. Yeah, so that's total levy. Yeah, it, it was like, cause yeah. he, he mentioned to me, I mean, there's 110 cities of the second class and, and uh, 102 of them or something like that had oh, higher mill levies. Yeah, I, was, I think I counted five. But that has a lot to do with our school districts. <laughs> I mean, we have a total. Oh no, no, I, I'm talking about ours was lower. No, lower. I'm not. I'm not uh, I'm we just, what I'm saying lower. is that the reason why ours is low is because the, the school district has taken such a high percentage <laughs> of the overall assessed levy mm -hmm. that we don't have a lot of flexibility in moving our mill levy. Well, up. but if you and but yeah, well, we can go down that a different. Time. But if you I actually know, look at I the know. total levy, including school districts and all taxing it, it's again like 80 out of 108, even including the school district. So, just to Chris's point, I. Yeah, we're you're always taxed too much. That's always the answer. You're always Absolutely. taxed too much. But, but yeah, you never get away from that. But, uh, but we're not that. nearly as burdensome as, as most of the other, other cities communities in the second class or cities of the first class even. Uh, yeah, Johnson County is just a unique animal all the yeah. way around. Yeah, we don't we don't necessarily compare good well with we don't Mission and Prairie Park. Village and Nogaland Park and Olathe. Oh, well in some instances you do. Uh, we no, had that mill levy discussion. Oh yeah, no, real close mm -hmm. with uh, Mission. Well, actually, we're, and we're we're higher than, I mean, we're we're less than Lenaxa, mm -hmm. for instance. So but, uh, yeah, you've had good financial management. The the Standard and Poor's says so every time. Yeah. Yes. So we're we're actually, you know, what you just got was a synopsis of what the finance and administration department goes through every year. We've solved it for you and brought it for your reaction before. Right. This time we put you right up front and collaborated with you and got your input. Mm -hmm. On the front side, you basically every time you start with where you are, what your needs are, what your resources are, and rattle it all out and see how it comes out. And you guys just walk through it. One follow-up question just as we look forward to more. Mm -hmm. um, at what point will we dis uh, discuss FTDs, FTEs and compensation and what the plan is for 2016? Mm -hmm. When I will that be presented to us? I actually talked to the pay and comp consultant today, and she is actually working on some numbers. She needs some additional information from us in terms of the um, 2014 evaluation so that she can plug those numbers in. And um, I've told her that I'd like for us to be able to get that back to the governing body next month. Uh, well, once so we have that, then we need to have the, the discussion because really, you know, to Christy's point from the last meeting, that's to, to try to find a way to implement that in 2015 because we budgeted a set amount. So then what, with exactly. that information, what do we take as our plan for 2016 to retain our talent? Yes, and, and her plan, the recommendation is going to be that we use some of that 230 to be able to go ahead and reward uh, performance. She's gonna use the comp ratio to do that. And then what we will be doing is, and it'll be based on a historic trend. We're gonna assume, okay, you've got the, you're gonna have the same level of performance as next year. Right. Maybe factor in a small increase and then ask for what the number would be to do the same thing next year. Okay. Because what we're seeing is as we continue to talk performance and transformation to a high performance organization, we're seeing people uh, work harder. So you're gonna see that in evaluation. Mm -hmm. So that should be sometime in April or maybe early May when that's gonna be available? Correct. Actually, I'm hoping the plan, I've asked her to do it April because what I really am sensitive to and what I'd like to do is to being able to go ahead and reward those employees that, because that's the work that was done last year. So I'm real sensitive to that and I'd like to see us do that and get that next month. Yeah, we so I, little, I called her today yeah. on that. So we're working on that. We talked a little too little about the human assets and that's really, right. when it comes down to our organization, obviously our, our, our ability to retain and recruit is critical. And uh, we've, we've, that's one of those areas that we've just fallen down on, so. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and actually, I'll leave it at that. Never mind. I'll save that for later. I mean, one of the things we didn't talk about a lot tonight, and I think we need to really make mark improvements on, is our total asset management programs. We've talked about the road program, but you know, there's a review of our fleet management of, of all these things, and how can we take the? It, it was eye-opening from the roads program to right. see this is this is how you build that kind of program, and how then you learn how to fund it. How can we take that same? There may not be a software involved the same sort of way, but how can we take 
that study and apply it into all of our asset management because I think we're falling behind there. No, I agree. And you know, I'm not. I don't know what Rob drove today up patrol, but I, I don't think it's as new as he wished it would be. So if we look at all those fleet management tools and make sure what our programs are in place, and then we need to look and see. Here's where we're at. Here's where we need to be, just like we did with roads. And here's the cost to reach it. Then you begin yep. to budget that. And, and so we need to go through that. And that probably needs to be part of 2016's budget. Although it'll be very difficult. But the, from a dollar, Thorpe Morris had Thorpe here. Let me speak. Hey, I get the eight. Ooh. We're already giving you eight and a half percent. We can't give you any more of those. But yeah. here's the part that we can do. We may not be able to fund everything, but most definitely what we can do is build the systems that will be in yeah, place when we looked into 2017 and already start ahead of the game say this is an initiative here's our fleet management program here's the shortfalls here how it needs to ramp up and here's the escalation to make it come to fruition but that's not just the, you know fleet management is what comes up but that's that's a lot of different ways we don't manage some of our capital assets probably as effectively as we need to be and if we don't begin that now everything gets more everything Cost a dollar today and a dollar ten tomorrow. We well, got to avoid the dollar tens when we can. Yeah. Well, when, when they did the infrastructure, when they did the infrastructure <laughs> an analysis, the assessments, they talked about, you know, physical right. plant, right, maintenance, replacement, you know, the software needed in order to be able to tell us where we had shortfalls and shortcomings, and it's the same thing with fleet. You're absolutely right. Those are capital investments that 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 are supposed to last us for X number of years. But there's a useful life on those assets. We've gone way beyond the useful life, Pretty especially in things like right. law enforcement vehicles, for example. I mean, there's stuff out there that should have been retired, you know, five, six years ago that they're being forced to use right now, especially some of their interceptor vehicles. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. But but you know, a, a, a fleet management program would go a long well, way towards fixing yeah, that and, problem. And, and, and uh, you know, with new leadership at the police department, I, I, yeah. my guess is that any luck, like, we're going to get. He's going to request the kind of equipment that, that the folks need, I agree. as opposed to, uh, you know, going to the brand of heat. It leads <laughs> it to Jeff. It leads it to Brian, David, well, where he's at today. I mean, yeah, you, gotta, and you know, at some point, it may be the kind of thing where asset management. It's a it's a huge piece of what we need to be doing, Absolutely. and it may be a position itself that creates cost savings. A salary for an asset management position creates the cost savings long term because of what they're able to do and manage and create. You know, uh, savings by doing things at the appropriate time rather than the expensive time when you run out of options. Like a facility. So yeah. Right. So here's what you have in cities, and here's what here's what you end up with. And Miriam actually just added one. It's a capital improvement director or a capital improvements manager. What we did, you, you're you're spot on when you talk about we need to have that. We realized that we didn't have a capital improvements program, so we kind of started to do that, and we tried to do it without a staff person, and just pulled people from each department and just kind of managed it and pieced together what we have. But really, the appropriate way to do it is to have a capital improvements person, because you're looking across the organization, and what you have to do when you develop a capital, what you want is you want a capital improvements element, which is a 20-year look, and then you want a capital improvements program which is a five-year snapshot that you continue to move forward through that 20-year look. And you want to manage that. You want to have priorities. You want to rank. You want to establish how you're going to rank those right. projects. And then you want to be bringing them to the local government, talking about how those priorities continue to move forward in five-year increments. That is a piece that we are missing here. And you're right. That is a position. That's a capital improvement manager or director or capital improvement analyst, but it is a capital improvement staff person. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a shared services. Response. That is a shared Ooh, service because you're trying absolutely. to, because what you need is you want the assessment of all the assets. And then you, as policymakers, need to balance whether it's parks, whether it's, right. and so you need all that information to be able to, to balance that. So if that's the direction that you want to go, this year, we can certainly look at that, and I'd be happy to to look at developing that component for you. That's all I have. Well, okay. We ran a couple of minutes uh, past yeah. eight, but yeah. but uh, but not too bad. I'm pretty happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Thank all you right. very much. That's it. Thanks everybody for coming.